My name is Brian Kenish. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I work on a few different products. Today I'm going to be talking about Google Chrome, and specifically I'll be talking about Chrome's shiny new extension system. So I'll start out with an intro on what extensions are. I'll show you some demos so you get an idea of what they look like and the sorts of things they can do. Then I'll talk a little bit about why we think extensions are interesting and worthwhile for developers, i.e. you guys to spend your time working on. And then I'll get details on the timeline uh, and the roadmap for when various pieces of the extension system will be released. After that, I'll get to the main part of my presentation, which is the technical stuff, what you're all here for. I'll start out with uh, how you go about building extensions in general. And I'll give a tour of the extension API. And then I'll take a specific example and walk through how we would go about coding it step by step. So we'll start out with a really simple hello world type of example, add more and more features until we end up with a non-trivial and hopefully useful extension. After that, I'll do a quick recap of the things that I covered. And finally, I'll take your questions at the end, but also this is pretty informal, so if you have questions at any point, just shout them out or, or raise your hand. Can everyone hear me okay, by the way? Yes? Good. All right, so what are Chrome extensions? Well, you already know what browser extensions are. They're programs, usually small ones, that modify the behavior of the browser and add bits of functionality to it. And Chrome extensions are just that for the Google Chrome browser. There are a bunch of unique things about Chrome extensions, though, otherwise you wouldn't be here. One really important thing is that they're written entirely with standard web technologies, so uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and so on. So if you know how to create web pages, you already know most of what you need to know to create Chrome extensions. And in fact, Chrome extensions are really web pages. You'll probably hear me say this a bunch of times in the, in the next hour. Of course, there's a little more to creating an extension than there is to creating a web page. We have an API that lets you integrate with Chrome features. The API is quite easy to learn. There's about 40 or so methods defined and 20 objects in the API. And I'll cover those later. And again, since Chrome extensions are web pages, the same development cycle that you use for creating a web page, you can uh, apply to Chrome extensions. So when you make a change to your extension, there's no compilation step involved or anything like that. You simply reload your extension and you can see the results of your changes instantly. You can also use the Chrome developer tools to inspect the DOM of your extensions and to de debug and profile their JavaScript. Finally, in terms of performance, extensions run in, separate OS, in a separate OS process, just like Google Chrome tabs do. So their performance is both isolated from the rest of the browser performance, and again, a power user can pop open their Chrome Task Manager and see exactly how each of their installed extensions are performing. And if they see one that's performing badly, they can uninstall it. So with that, I'm going to jump into some demos, but does anyone have any questions about anything I just said? All right, cool. So the first demo that I'm going to show you is a simple Gmail checker. It's going to install a little icon in my Chrome toolbar. And if I'm logged into Gmail, which I believe I am now, it will pop, uh, put up a badge on top of the icon that displays the count of my unread messages. So I'm going to switch browsers here, and I'll explain why I'm doing this in one second. So here's my installer. And again, I just click through a simple dialog here. And it's going to tell me what exactly the extension is doing. In this case, it's allowed to make SHR requests to Google.com. And that's what I want, so I'm going to install it. But uh, quick note on why I'm switching browsers here. So the demos that I'm going to show you, I'm running in a tip of tree build of Chrome. So it has slightly newer extension features into it. in it. Uh, these will be pushed to the dev channel shortly. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry. I'm going to explain it all in, in a couple of slides. So I want you to pay attention, before I click Install here, to my Chrome toolbar here, right over here. Because this extension does a little nifty uh, animation while it's polling for my account of unread messages. 
So there it goes. Hopefully you can see that it's kind of small. So what happened there was uh, the extension uses canvas to paint that little animation. It has a badge on top of it that has my unread email count, which looks like it's 362, which is a lot. So I, I better hurry up and, and speak quickly so I can get back to reading email. Uh, that badge is actually not rendered by the extension. It's part of the extension API. And I'll talk about that more later. When I start working through code, we're actually going to manipulate that. So the next extension that I'm going to show you is a feed detector. It'll examine the contents of every page that I'm on and see if there's an RSS feed available on that page. And if so, it'll give me uh, the option to click on a button and subscribe to any of those feeds. So the first thing I'm going to do here is uninstall this previous extension that I put in just to keep my UI as uncluttered as possible when I'm demoing this stuff. This is the extension management page, by the way. So again, I get a similar dialogue here, except this extension is asking for permission to access every website, which it has to do in order to examine the contents of the, each page. Again, that's fine, so I'm going to install it. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a Google search for Google Developer Day. And you'll notice that nothing happened. So Right in here is where the extension would normally appear. But there happens to be no RSS feed for Google, uh, regular Google search results. So I'm going to click on news. Is this news? Yes. OK, good guess. I don't know, since I've been here, all my results are in check. I guess I can switch that in the URL here. But. OK, so I'm going to click on news. There is a, a feed available for a news search result. So you'll see, again, if you pay attention over here, there's going to be an icon that shows up. And there it is. So I have this feed icon. And then if I click on it, it's going to bring up a page that's built by the extension that lets me subscribe to a list of feeds that are available on that page. So again, I'm going to uninstall this one. And I'm going to show you one more extension. So any questions about any of those that I showed before? OK. So this last one that I'm going to show is for a very specific use case, which is if you have ever uh, been in that in the situation where you're trying to get a URL or other, some other long text from your main computer to your mobile device, uh, you know, let's say I have an Android phone here. Uh, you know it's a, um, a pain because you have to type one character at a time. If you type one character wrong, you have to start all over again. So what this extension does is it allows you to take URLs and translate them into QR codes. And it also lets you select any arbitrary text and do the same. Uh, so, uh, so let me fire this up here. Again, this has a similar dialogue where it's asking for permission to access every page, which it needs to do. And let me click back over to my Google search result here. So you can see if I mouse over these links, I get a bunch of long URLs. And they would potentially take me a while to type into my, my phone. So I toggle this extension on by pressing Control Q. And now when I mouse over these links, I'm going to get a QR code that pops up. And again, I could pull out my phone, scan it in, and press one button to get to the site instead of having to type all those characters in. And again, like I mentioned, you can also select some arbitrary text here. Let's say I wanted to copy and paste something over to my phone. I could do that. And again, I press Control Q, and I'll get a barcode with that encoded information. So I don't have a mobile phone hookup here, but I have a screenshot of some software that would deal with QR codes. So uh, this is a piece of software called Barcode Reader that runs on Android. And you simply hold your, your phone up to, up to your QR code, and then you, press, you can press this, this one button to open in a browser. 
So those are some examples of the things that you can do with extensions. Just a little tip of the iceberg, but I'm going to come back. These are a bunch of different use cases that I'll come back to later when I explain the technical bits of extensions. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that would be done with a content script, which is what this third extension I showed that uses. Uh, when I, I'll walk through the API and I'll talk more about content scripts, and I'll also, when we look at code, show you exp specifically where it gets inserted. Any other questions? Okay. So, a few words on why we think it's important, uh, extensions are important and, and worthwhile for developers. Number one, Chrome is a really rapidly growing platform. So there are more than 30 million active users on the Chrome browser right now. And that number has more than tripled in the last two quarters. So it's growing really fast. Google, Chrome is, is also a really key platform for Google overall, not just in the form of the browser, but we also have the Chrome OS coming. And actually, if you build an extension for the Chrome browser, you're also building a Google Chrome OS app without having to do any extra work. So there's a big opportunity to have a first mover advantage if you start building extensions now. Secondly, extensions allow you to have a persistent presence on your users' machines. So if you run a website and you have a loyal user that installs your extension, even when they navigate away from your site, they can continue to interact with your web service. In the same way, you can use an extension to drive traffic back to your site as users jump around the web. And finally, I'll harp on this a, a bunch as well, extensions are really easy. So I think you can probably get your first Hello World extension up and running in 10 to 20 minutes if you've never built an extension before. And the nice thing about extensions is that once you get over that initial, uh, you know, figure out those initial basics, then you can just start applying the web knowledge that you already have. And making extensions bigger and better is just a matter of applying the skills that you, you already have. So the extension system is available currently in the Google Chrome dev channel. So I'll take a step back and describe the different releases of Chrome. Chrome comes in three different flavors. There's a stable channel, a beta channel, and a dev channel. The stable channel is where the vast majority of users are. And as the name implies, it's the most stable build of Chrome. The beta channel is where we put all the features that we expect to end up in the stable version, but they're not quite ready for prime time. We want to polish them more. They might still be a little bit buggy. And we do a release uh, to the beta channel about once every month or so. And then finally, we have the dev channel where in addition to all those features that we expect to end up in the stable build of Chrome, we also try out experimental stuff. And these are likewise uh, unpolished, and it's, it's similarly the uh, most buggy version of Chrome. We obviously try to keep it as bug-free as possible. So the extension system is currently in this uh, dev channel. We are bringing it to the beta channel later this quarter. So. Uh, sometime in the next couple of months, it'll end up on the beta channel. It'll be exposed to a wider audience. And around that same time, we're going to be launching an extension gallery. So we'll make extensions a whole lot more findable, uh, which is great from a developer perspective. And we don't have an exact date on this yet, but sometime soon after we do that push to the beta channel, we'll be releasing to the stable channel, where it'll be uh, available to the widest audience possible. So with that, I'm going to get into the technical bits. Any questions about any of this timeline or? Yes. So Chromium is the name of the open source version of Chrome. And Google Chrome is the branded version that Google puts out. So every, all the extension uh, system changes that we make will be in Chromium. So if others want to run their own branded version of, of Chromium, they can do that. Yeah, I meant that if I you know, download it 
Do they, you know, the nightly build, mm. the extension system? Yes. So the build where I'm demoing is the tip of tree build. It's the latest possible build. So the extension system is in there. Any other questions? Okay. Let's talk about how to build extensions. So first of all, I want to cover uh, the structure of, the, of the, an extension. There's a particular structure that each extension has. So an extension is simply a compressed directory. You put all your files into one directory, and then you package it. On our side, we're simply creating a signed zip out of your directory. And actually, I mentioned earlier that a developer can look at the source of any extension. The way that you can do that is we distribute extensions as these file, files called CRX files, which are these signed zips. You can simply open them in most zip programs and unzip them to see the entire contents of the directory. And there's this one particular file that every extension has. It's a manifest file. And in addition to every extension having this, it has to have a certain name. And it's the only uh, file whose name matters. And it's called manifest.json. As the name implies, it's JSON formatted data. And it contains metadata about the extension, things like its name, a description, icons for the extension. And it also contains the capabilities and the permissions of the extension. So uh, what sorts of things it's allowed to access in the browser. And also, it has pointers to all the rest of the files in the extension, all the components that actually give the extension its ability. And that's what we'll talk about next. So with just a manifest file, an extension can't really do much. When I start walking through code, the first example that we're going to look at is just a plain manifest file. It doesn't really do anything. In order for an extension to do something, you have to give it one of these additional components. The first is a browser action or page action. These are the two UI surfaces that the extension system will initially ship with. And we've looked at both of these earlier. So a browser action is what we saw in the Gmail checker. It's an icon that appears in the Chrome toolbar. And it's persistent. So it appears across different tabs and windows. A page action, on the other hand, is what we saw in the feed detector example. It's an icon that selectively appears in the Chrome Omnibar. So it can be toggled on and off, and it can appear or not appear on any given page. I should note also that, so you know that Chrome has this very uh, clean aesthetic, very minimal aesthetic. We're trying an experiment with the extension system where initially an extension will only be able to use one or the other of these uh, UI surfaces. So uh, it's a bit of an experiment. We'll see how it works. But uh, for now, you can only use one of these. The next component that we have is a content script, which is what we saw in the QR code example. A content script is CSS or JavaScript that gets injected into the source of any matching pages. You can think of this as similar to user scripts. Next, we have a background page. So, when you start getting into complex extensions, you have all these components to manage and juggle. And each of the components have different scopes. There can be multiple instances of a given component. In order to keep track of all of those, you can use a background page, which you have one instance of per extension. And this allows you to manage things like tasks and state within the extension. I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. And then finally, an extension that inside your extension directory, you can also include any other web files that you want. So images, style sheets, flash files, what have you. It can be anything. Since extensions are just web pages, any web files will do. So that's it for the components of an extension. Any questions about anything that I just mentioned? Alrighty. OK, so I talked a little bit about the different scope that con extension components have on the previous slide. I'll talk a little bit more about that here. So any given extension can have up to one background page, and it's global in scope. And again, it lets you manage the different pieces of an extension. In addition to that, you can have a browser action, which has one instance per browser window. So again, you can have multiple instances of a, of a browser action. And then you have page actions and content scripts, which have one instance per browser tab. So you can have even more of those. And the way that you manage 
uh, the interaction between all of those is by using extension communication. So as part of the API, we allow you to send and receive messages from and to different pieces of your extension. And also an extension is, make, is capable of doing external communication in the form of cross-origin XHR. You do this by specifying a permission in your manifest file. You specify which pages and sites you're allowed to contact. And then you simply use XHR as you normally would. So next, I'll cover the, uh, what the extension API looks like. Again, I mentioned it's a quite a small API. We have this Chrome object. It's a top-level object that every extension automatically gets access to. And inside of this object, we've subdivided the API into six different modules. They're each encapsulated in an object that's contained within this Chrome object. So the first is Chrome.extension. This contains methods and properties for uh, primarily utility methods and properties for sending and receiving messages. It also lets you do things like get the absolute URL of any of your extension components, which you'd normally point to with relative URLs. Next, we have a browser action that simply lets you manage browser actions. So it lets you set the contents of your uh, browser action icon, and also the badge that we sh saw that appeared on top of the Gmail checker. You can set the contents of this. It'll take up to four characters. You can set the background color. I should mention a browser action is a 19 by 19 pixel uh, space. So you can fill that either with uh, a stock image or you can paint it with canvas, which is uh, actually the first Gmail checker demo that we looked at does both of those. Next, we have page actions. This a API simply lets you toggle the state of a page action on and off per a given tab. So the next set of objects that we have let you manipulate features of the browser. The first is Chrome.Windows, which lets you create, delete, get, and set uh, Windows objects. And this requires you to set a tabs permission in your manifest file. That's not a typo, by the way. Since tabs and windows are very closely related, we uh, have them share a common permission. The next object is tabs. And again, this requires a tabs permission. It simply lets you do the same things with tabs, the familiar CRUD operations. And finally, we have bookmarks. Again, you can create, delete, get and set uh, the bookmark, user's bookmark tree using this API. And this requires a bookmarks permission. Any questions about the API? All righty. So in addition to the API that comes with the extension system, since extensions are just web pages, there are a lot of other useful APIs that you can hook into. The first is the standard JavaScript and DOM APIs, which you can use to tra traverse and manipulate any of the components of your extension. Next, we have HTML5 APIs. So Chrome has pretty robust HTML5 support already. There are, particular, there are some, uh, some APIs that are particularly useful for extensions. Uh, things like Canvas, which I mentioned, audio, the audio and video elements. You can also use geolocation. And local storage is especially useful if you want to persist state, uh, the user state across browser sessions. Next, we have the WebKit APIs. Since Chrome extensions obviously don't have to be cross-browser compatible. You can use APIs that are specific to WebKit. And there happen to be some really cool experimental uh, animation and CSS features that are built into WebKit. We saw a, a little bit of the sort of thing that you can do in that Gmail checker with the spinny, with the spinny Gmail icon. Next, we have V8 APIs. So V8 comes bundled with JSON support in particular, which is quite useful for uh, parsing the results of XML HTTP requests. And then bundle JavaScript libraries. So if you're a particular fan of, a, uh, of some JavaScript framework like jQuery or Prototype, you can include those in your extension and use them just as you normally would. So you don't have to do standard DOM manipulation. You can do it with one of these frameworks. And finally, any other API that you can access with JavaScript, many of the Google APIs fall into this category. We have 20 or 30 of them that are uh, Java, JavaScript friendly. You can access simply through your extension. 
Okay, with that, we're going to look at a step by step example. I'll just throw out anyone questions? Okay, cool. So, this example that we're going to build is a mashup between Chrome and Twitter. It's called Critter. It's a, a simple Twitter client, it's read only. It'll let you view your, uh, your most recent tweets. First, we're going to start out by accessing the public timeline, and then we'll access uh, a user's friend's timeline. All right, so I mentioned that we're going to start out really simple. Uh, this is basically the hello world of an extension. We're just going to add a basic UI to uh, the Chrome toolbar. And here's my manifest file. So you can see that it just contains basic stuff, the name of the extension, the version, a little description of the extension, icons that will be loaded when the user installs the extension. And then here in particular is where the UI stuff is happening. So we're going to start out with a browser action. And we're just going to specify a default icon and we're going to give it a name, which is a tooltip. When you mouse over the extension, this is what will show up. So that's all there is to it. I'm going to go ahead and install this extension. So you can see there's an empty confirmation dialog here because this extension doesn't do anything. And there we go. There's our first Hello World extension. We just have the icon that we put in there. And when I mouse over it, I get a tooltip that says Critter, which I also specified. Yep. Just one small question. Sure. Can I change the uh, icon or anything based on the page? Yes. So the way you could do that is a little more complicated. You could have a content script that detects the, the page and then sends a message to the browser action that says, hey, I'm on this other page. Can you switch the icon? And actually, we're going to incorporate a content script a little later into this. It's not that particular case, but it does something a little bit similar. It sends a message to the, the main extension. And so if I click on this, you'll notice it doesn't, have, uh, it doesn't do anything at all. So let's change that. Let's make it do something when I click. I'm just going to uninstall this extension first. All right, so first of all, in my manifest file, you notice that I just added one line here, which is a pop-up, and I'm pointing to an HTML, uh, a file called popup.html. Oh, sure, sorry. Thank you. Does that work better? Bigger? Yes? Okay. So I'll just go back to my original manifest file so you can see the difference here. So I just added this one line, popup.html. And I'm going to open that popup file. And you'll see that this is just a super duper simple HTML file. Uh, all I'm saying in, in here is I'm writing a little line of text that says, wouldn't it be nice to see some tweets here? So let me fire this extension up. So again, I get this familiar icon here. If I mouse over it, I get that same tooltip. But now I can click on it, and I get a little pop-up bubble that says the text that I just entered in there. Any questions? All right, so I'll uninstall that again. All right, so next, let's actually make it do something useful. What we're going to do is we're going to go out and fetch the public Twitter timeline and put it in there so I get a little Twitter reader. So 
So first of all, I'm going to make a little change to this manifest file here. Let me toggle between them. So you can see I added a field for permissions. And I'm specifying two permissions, tabs and uh, twitter.com, which I can make an XHR request to. The reason I have the tabs permission in there is that we're going to make, uh, we're going to turn URLs into links, and when you click on one of them, we want it to open into a new tab, not to o override that same page. So we specify the tabs permission as well. Then next in my, I'm going to add a whole bunch of stuff to our pop-up file here. So you can see we added a bunch of JavaScript. And I'll first show you the HTML that we added, and then we'll get to the JavaScript. So in our HTML, we created a little title. And we've added a template, which we're going to fill in and clone a bunch of times to uh, ho house the, the contents of each tweet that we loop through. So by itself, this HTML doesn't really do anything. It just has a title that says critter. So this, the JavaScript is going to do the rest of the work here. And I should have noted that So we have an onload event handler called init. This init function is just going to get all the, it's going to fetch all the different components of that template that's in there. And then it's going to call this get tweets function. So here's where our real work happens. We're just going to set up an issue and XML HTTP request. And it's just a simple get request to Twitter's API to fetch the public timeline. Again, we're getting this in JSON format, which we're going to take advantage of the fact that there's JSON support built into V8 to actually parse the results of this request. So we have a onload handler called process tweets, which is our next function here. And here's where we take advantage of V8. So we parsed out those JSON results using the built-in V8 APIs. And then we call a simple update function that actually inserts the contents of each tweet into the page. So we ha I set here an arbitrary count of how many tweets to insert in each page. This is just in case the connectivity doesn't work that well. But normally, we would want to loop through the entire array of, of tweets and display all of them and, and probably pa paginate them as well, which we're not doing in this example. So we set a bunch of variables. And then each, in each of our template components, we're setting uh, information from the contents that we got back from the Twitter API call. So first, we're setting the image stuff then the author name, the actual content of the tweet. And then finally, we clone that template and insert it into the HTML file. So I know I just covered a bunch of stuff. Any questions about any of that? All right, let's take a look at actually what it does. So this time, I'm actually going to get some dialogue here because I'm asking for requests uh, to make requests to Twitter.com. Again, that's what I want, so I'm going to install it. And we have our familiar icon here. Now, if I click on it, I should get a little UI that contains uh, the first seven tweets from the public timeline. And there we go. So it's formatted all nicely. We added links, and we inserted it into our template there. All right, so next we're just going to do a little bit of refactoring to get ready to, well, so the public timeline isn't super useful. If you guys are Twitter users, you really want your friend's timeline. So we're going to do some refactoring to get ready for that. We're also going to add a badge to the browser action. Okay, so first, let's take a look at what we do with our manifest file here. Okay, 
So you can see we just made a tiny little change, which is to add a background page. So the refactoring that we're going to do is we're going to add all of our non-presentation code into our background page to make it easier to work with the extension later on. This will also let us change the UI so that we, when we get the count of how many unread tweets there are, we can put up a badge that says that on top of the, the, the icon. So first, let's take a look at oops, what we've done with our pop-up HTML file. So we've just taken out a bunch of stuff here. You can see before, we had 91 lines in there. And now we've taken out about 20 or so lines. And we've moved those to a background page. And in our background page, we now have this get tweets function, as well as our process tweets function. But we've added one key piece to this function here, which is that we're now keeping track of the count of unread tweets. And if we see that there's more than zero of them, we'll make an API call to add a badge and set the contents of the badge to the unread count. So now, when I initially install the extension, after that uh, XHR request comes back, we'll see a count on, on the badge. So in this particular file, I'm specifying a fetch frequency of five minutes, so it won't really be doing too much dynamic with the badge. But potentially, we could set this a lot higher, and you could see the badge actually updating over time. All right, so now you see that that badge showed up there. And when I click, I get the same thing. It's just the code is in a little bit different places. All right, so finally, we're ready to access the, uh, the user's friends timeline rather than this public timeline here. And we're going to make a whole bunch of changes in order to do that. First, in our manifest file, so in the manifest file here, we've added a content script. And the reason we've done this is in order to get the user's friends timeline, we actually have to be logged into Twitter. And we're going to use OAuth to do that. And we're going to use this content script to get the OAuth pin and send it back to the extension, which will save a step for the user having to copy that and paste it into the extension. So this content script is going to examine the contents of the authentication page. And if there's a pin there, it'll send it back to the main extension, the background page particularly. Next, in our pop-up file, So we're adding a bunch of HTML here to have two different states, because we want a signed in state and a signed out state. If the user isn't authenticated yet, we show them the signed out UI. And if they are authenticated, we obviously show them the signed in UI. So we're initially just hiding the signed in UI and, and displaying the signed out UI. should also mention that, so we have, when we click, we, we're inserting a, a button here that lets you sign in. And when it, that's clicked on, we're making a, uh, a call to our background page to authorize. And that will initiate the sequence to get the OAuth information. So next, I'm going to pull open my background page here. So in the interest of not having a gigantic amount of code in here, because the OAuth stuff gets a little bit hairy, I've put a bunch of this into a utility file here. But the important parts, extension-wise, are still in this file. 
So instead of just initially starting the fetch to get tweets, instead we're going to wait for a callback from the authentication. When, it, when that callback happens, then we, then we initi initiate our fetching. And in our get tweets function here, instead of just making a simple XHR request, we're passing this to a function that will make a signed OAuth request. And the key piece for this example is that we have added a listener. So this is going to listen for messages that are coming in from the content script and specifically looking for an OAuth pin, which it'll use to make signed requests. So in our content script, we're going to set a, a status, which is what this is looking for here. It'll either be success equals true or success equals false. And if it's true, we're going to send the pin along with the message. And then finally, let's look at our content script. So again, a content script is injected CSS or JavaScript. Here we have a JavaScript file that's going to be injected into matching files. Let me just go back to my manifest file to show you what, what it's matching here. So we're looking for this particular OAuth page that's residing on Twitter's domain. And when that matches, we have a very simple content script here that fetches the element that contains the OAuth pin and then it initiates a extension communication message. If the pin was found, it cleans it up a little bit and as I mentioned, it sets success equals to true and it sends the pin. If the pin was not found, it sends uh, the message that indicates it, it wasn't. All right, so let's take a look at all of that, what it actually does. Okay, so now you can see that instead of having a count of my unread messages, I get a little question mark box here. And when I click on that, I get this UI to sign into Twitter. So I think I'm already signed into Twitter. So I should just get an OAuth page if I click on that, which I am. So I can just click Allow here. And this is going to redirect me to a page that contains the OAuth pin. And you can see the content script, I didn't have to do anything. The content script grabbed the, that pin and fed, fed it back into my extension. And now I have a count of my unread tweets here. And if I click on this, I'll have my, my friend's timeline rather than the public timeline. This time, we've taken out the restriction of only showing seven tweets because I already have all these images cached on my machine so they can load quickly. And so I can see 20, 20 tweets instead. Again, we don't have this paginated, but that was, that's something that you would probably want to add in an extension like this. All right, so I'm running pretty short on time here, so I'm just going to fly through a couple remaining slides that I have. So I just want to leave you with three things about extensions. Number one, very small learning curve. As I mentioned, if you haven't written an extension before, I think you can get your first Hello World extension up and running in 10 or 20 minutes. Number two, there's a big opportunity, more than 30 million potential users out there on Chrome, and that number is growing really, really fast. As I mentioned, two-thirds of those 30 million have come online in the last six months. And finally, we have a bunch of upcoming community events that are happening locally. Uh, if you guys are involved in the local GTUG here, there's talk about doing a Chrome extension themed event, and there are also events that are going on in the next couple of months all, all around the world. So I, I would recommend that you get Involved on the GTUG side, I think you can go to uh, gug.cz if you're in, uh, in the Czech Republic. And if not, go to gtugs.org where you can see the full list of local GTUGs. And with that, I'll take questions. 
And I'll just leave you with a bunch of uh, links to useful resources where you can find more information about extensions. Yes? Could you say that again? Yes. So if you go to our, dis it's not very findable yet, but it is findable. If you go to our discussion group, uh, groups.google.com slash group slash Chromium extensions and search for Critter, C-H-R-I-T-T-E-R. -T -T yep. Yep. That, that's our PM. He, he wrote the extension. So it, I think he distributed it as a CRX file. So you can open that up in a program like seven. Okay, good. Yes. Yep. So the Chrome developer tools work fairly well with extensions, and they're getting better. We're adding more support into them for extensions. But you can use them to inspect the DOM of your different extension components. And also, like I mentioned, uh, you can profile and debug the JavaScript of your extensions. Sure. Yep. Uh, is like something that would come from Google, you mean? Uh, no, say I have you know, 50 employees, mm. and I want all, you know, that when they start their Chrome, I want to have them the extension already installed. Gotcha. If they updated to the newer version of Chrome, they're going to be lacking that extension. It's a good question. Come, can you give me your name after, and we'll be in touch. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that would work. Did Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it seemed it would be nice to have a more robust solution than that. So yeah, come come talk to me after. We'll, we'll be in touch. Any other questions? Yes. Is there any UI options? Yep. So we just added some uh, some UI for options. I don't think it got pushed to our docs yet. But if you look at the docs on the trunk, it's available there. And I think we're doing a push. I think it it might have happened yesterday, or it's happening today. I, I'm confused with the time here, so uh, it, um, it should be in the documentation very shortly. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's very new. That's a big, big question that we got after we released this new, because uh, br browser action, that UI is very new. It's in the last couple of weeks, so that was one of the, the first initial things we got asked about. Anyone else? Yep. Yep. So that's our extension gallery, which should be coming this quarter. So that'll, that'll be the, the primary source, I would think, for most users to find extensions. And it, it'll be great for developers, because you can put your extensions there and then have them much more findable than they would be today. Anyone else? Great. Well, thanks a lot, guys. If you have any more questions, I'll be around. So feel free to uh, come ask me. Thank you.